Okay, welcome to part two of our review of Victory Games Vietnam. This time we're going to be talking about the tactical aspects of the game, combat, and some general commentary. Okay, it's all about combat, right? Well, the combat system here is unique as far as um, as far as I know. There are some aspects of it that I haven't seen anywhere else, and it takes some time getting used to, it, and that's what the scenarios basically do. Well, let's look at them, uh, and we'll notice some of the, the aspects of this, which are familiar. Of course, here's our standard unit. Now, a lot of this is, is familiar stuff. Uh, okay, this number down here in the corner it's going to look very familiar. This is the unit strength. This is a three. Uh, this VC battalion is a two. There's one strength for offense and defense. Okay. The eight is its movement points. This one can move six. And this little number here, the smaller one, this is the fire support, basically the artillery or mortars or whatever else it has. You'll notice this VC unit has zero. The US unit has three with it. Now, there is just a trick to this. I will show you. This is what this unit normally looks like. It has zero um, artillery of its own. And the artillery can be is normally in a headquarters unit, meaning that's the separate artillery unit. For the US units, you have the option to, quote, deploy them, which doesn't really mean what it sounds like. This means the artillery is split up amongst them. So normally there would be eight artillery points in the brigade. In this case, you're gonna give, you're gonna divide it out into each unit. If they're gonna be operating separately, that is helpful. Now, of course, you will notice the U.S. has a lot of artillery points and the NVA really, uh, the VC doesn't, the NVA has some. And this is going to be very important in this game and this is one of the controversial uh, factors about the game. So this, this is pretty much standard, right? And of course, the unit designations. Uh, this is the 1st Cav Division and this is, here it's being it only goes down to the division level uh, in terms of accuracy. So this is 3rd Battalion of 3rd Brigade. I mean, we, we know that's not what they're called uh, in the Army, so it doesn't go down to actual battalion designations, but what, whatever. Okay, the divisions do. Okay, so uh, it seems like we got some straightforward units here. But this is, combat is not going to go the same way that it normally does in any other kind of game. Also, I want to point out something about these VC units here. You notice they have this little star on them, and that is because I'm playing in the solo mode, which is called the referee mode here. Um, so I can see this. Uh, the, the way the game is normally played, if you played this out of the box, the VC units have this blue, uh, blue with the star on the back and they are deployed upside down, meaning you don't know what they actually are. And when you go to draw these units, you don't know what you're gonna get because they vary in terms of their strength. Uh, these are all battalions, but they've got different strengths to them. What this star means is that the US unit doesn't know that. This, this one is still technically hidden until they come into conflict. Um, they won't know that. Then I can reveal the unit. Okay, that's the unit. Uh, so you never know. The VC actually have some units which have a combat strength of zero. And if anybody moves on top of them, they will go away. But again, you technically don't know that until you try them. And so this is one of the things, if you're playing this solo, you just have to uh, you know, uh, agree with yourself not to not to use that knowledge. You have to go after that section as if it were a, a full strength battalion. Okay, so we think these two are going to fight, but this is not necessarily so. And this is where the 
combat rules get a little bit complicated, but you'll get used to them as you play. So first off, the VC, uh, the game has done a great job of representing the slipperiness of the VC, right? They're very hard to pin down. And this is one of, be one of the biggest frustrations is that you're going to be chasing them all over the board and they can get away. Now, you can drive them out of the city. We've got a bunch of VC units sitting in Plate Coup. We can definitely drive them out of Plate Coup, but killing them, that's another big spot. So they're going to go to someplace else. If they can, if they can go to another city, they'll go there. So you have to occupy most of the cities. Now, we at least want to occupy the city so that they have to go up here into these hexes. And remember, these hexes are only worth half a point each. Okay, so you can see why you end up spending a lot of U.S. units covering a lot of territory and not really engaging uh, the enemy that much. Okay, so the first trick that the VC has, which nobody else in the game has, is something called alert movement. Uh, I call this the skedaddle. This basically is going to enable them, if this U.S. battalion drops right on top of that VC battalion, if it were anyone else, they would have to fight. They'll have to fight until one unit leaves or is destroyed. The VC and the VC alone are going to get the option to skedaddle on out of there. Now, they don't always get to do this, okay? but they, I mean, they get to try, but it doesn't always work. But this goes first, and they're going to roll a die. And uh, the score on that die plus the terrain value of whatever terrain you're sitting in is going to be added together. Now, in this case, they're fighting out on an open, it's a very rare patch of open land in the Canton province, which is this, this one is going to be a notorious, uh, a notorious VC hideout. So that, that piece of land is only worth terrain value of one, meaning the movement point cost is one. Well, I rolled, I don't know if you can see that, but I rolled a one. That means a total of two. This thing can skedaddle with two points. Well, it's not gonna be able to do that. Okay, if it's occupying the same hex as an enemy unit, that is plus two to the movement cost. If it's in the zone, that's a plus one. Okay, so meaning if the US unit had been next to them and they rolled a two, they would be able to move back this far. This is why in almost all cases, when you attack, you're going to want to go right on top of them. However, it would cost three movement points to move even here, and they're still adjacent and they can still attack you. It, it's going to cost more than that to move into any of these other hexes. So with a roll of one, they're not going anywhere. They don't get to skedaddle. But suppose they had been sitting in this jungle and we rolled a six, uh, they would be able to get out of there. Uh, the U.S. can use air power or artillery power to interdict, meaning adding extra movement points for them to leave. And the South Vietnamese have uh, special ranger units, which they have completely uh, separate rules for how those work. They are very useful in preventing the uh, VC from running away. But this could happen. And so this is going to be one of the biggest uh frustrations if this unit is out there in the jungle and we want to go hunt them down uh because the general wants a body count it's going to be really hard for this unit to pin them down they're just going to run and of course uh i don't know if you can see but this is the laotian border once you get across this you can't go after them. you can bomb them but you can't go after them. uh so Basically, chasing them down is going to be very hard. If they're in a capital, yeah, we can go in and drive them out of the capital, drive them into the woods, uh, and, and that's what you're going to want to do. But actually killing them is very difficult. Now, this works much better in a place like Kantum, which only has uh, a total of three cities and a lot of jungle. 
when you go down to the Mekong Delta, this is going to be the most problematic area uh, because this is all cultivated land and every hex here is worth one point. Uh, the VC, I've got them grouped just to, um, I, I set this up just to make it convenient for me. Normally they're going to want to spread out. They're going to want to spread out, avoid the US units and cover as much ground as they can. Up here, they're not going to get a lot of points for it. Down in the Delta, they're going to want to cover, blanket this entire area. And it's going to be very, very hard to deny them the territory. They're going to rack up a lot of um, population points down there. Uh, that is going to be your most problematic area. That's going to be the area you're going to pour a lot of forces into. And if you have a lousy commander in that area, uh, it's just bad news. Okay, but anyway, back to combat. Notice we haven't even had combat. And in many cases, you won't. So if I'm the U.S. unit, I have to declare, you declare an operation. And pretty much the term for attack is a search and destroy mission. So if I have this stack and I want to go after this VC battalion, I'm going to have to declare it meaning I'm going to declare the units that are involved in this. I'm going to declare what sort of fire support they're going to get. If I really want to maximize my fire support, I'm going to declare um, a free fire zone, which in, in this case you certainly wouldn't. But uh, if you're going after a big unit, you're going to have to do that. Okay, And this unit could escape, meaning we did all this for nothing. And so... You know, one of the big goals, I don't know if it's a big goal, but one of the things you're trying to do as the, uh, the VC player is just to get the U.S. to waste operations. Okay, so if I just dedicated this whole stack of units to an operation and they were not able to actually get in combat with this VC, their turn is over. And again, they've wasted it. That would be a victory for this one strength VC unit to have basically made all these folks waste a turn. Um, that's good for them. Okay. So again, you, you see the slipperiness and sort of the mind games and in, in the in the tactics. And this really comes into play. It's very well woven into the game mechanics. So this is the first way that the VC might escape. Now we said. Um, he didn't successfully do it up here, and so now they're going to have to battle. And so these two units are going to fight. Uh, and this is where some of the good, the bad, and the ugly of this combat system comes into it. Okay, so let's say we've actually got combat taking place here. Now we go to the combat resolution uh, phase and this is a part of the game that is quite distinct uh, it doesn't seem to me like anything else I've encountered and is quite controversial so let's look at it let's take an example of some units in combat okay so here we are at the combat resolution so Let's pretend that these are our units that are going to have combat. Okay, we've got four VC battalions against uh, three US infantry and an artillery unit. Okay, pretty standard. Now, for combat in this game, you have to separate out the ground combat values from the fire support. In this case, it's artillery support, but they can have air support, they can have naval gunfire, the U.S. can. And those two numbers we're going to see play very different roles. So let's look at what we've got. Okay, so ground combat strength. The VC have seven, U.S. have nine. Okay, this seems pretty close so far, but the big difference is going to be the fire support. So we're going to add that in the VC have zero for fire support, and most of their units are going to have zero. They, some of them have one for mortars, but that's it. 
So their total strength is a seven. Oh, oh, when we added in the US fire support, it's 16 and it brings it up to 25. And this is very typical. The US is going to very often have more fire support than they have ground power. Okay, now this is assuming they're in a free fire zone or else that number would be half. Okay, so now you see what a big difference this makes. So far, this doesn't seem in, like anything unusual. Pretty much uh, any game has this. So this means we end up with a combat ratio of three to one. Now, this plays out a little bit differently in this game than that does in most. So let's look at the combat resolution chart. Okay, here it is. Now, normally you would expect up on the top, the columns are usually, this is where the combat ratio is. So this would be like one to one, three to two, two to one, and so forth. No, that's not the way it plays out here. In this case, the ratios are just die roll modifiers. They end up being much, much less significant than in, in a normal game. Uh, if you're attacking four to one, that's the big thing and you're usually gonna win. Here, not so much. So, okay, three to one in that example, that would mean that the US would get a plus three modifier. And then of course, as you know, every combat is gonna have a terrain modifier. So if they're in the mountains, it's going to be a minus three. If they're in the jungle, it's a minus two. So this might um, play out fairly evenly. So if that's not what the columns are, the columns are based on the strength of the force being um, calculated. And this is where the game is unique. And for better or worse, I think there are good and bad points to this. So let's see how that would play out in our particular example okay all right so we're going to use these same numbers and this is why you're going to want to write them down in this fashion um, just exactly the way i have it written because you use this to determine the ratio but when you determine who takes what damage going to do something a little bit funky and this when you first read this in the rules it seems strange but you get quite used to it the column you use to determine what damage you take is your strength plus the enemy's artillery or fire support whatever fire support they have okay so in this particular example you see, the VC are going to take damage as if they are a 23. They're seven points plus the 23 fire support points from the other side. Now, I get the logic of this, okay? This number is basically showing the target you are. The more ground troops you have, basically the more targets you have for this bombardment to hit. I, I get that, but this is one of the ways I think that this game very much preferences firepower over infantry power. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, this is quite controversial and I think has some negative aspects. So this means these VC are going to take a pounding. They're going to take damage as if they are 23. What about the U.S.? Well, the VC have no artillery, just as they're probably not going to have any artillery in most of their attacks. So the U.S. is going to take damage as if they are nine. What does that mean in terms of the game? OK, so let's go back to our chart. OK, here we are on the chart. Now, the key thing, there's only one die roll. So I'm going to roll a die. OK, in this case, a one comes up. Um, you, you roll one die. Now in this game, there are some things you roll with two and some with one, which is a bit, I don't know why they didn't make them all twos, but they did. So combat resolution is going to be rolled with a one plus the modifier. So we know the U.S. got plus three, so that's a four. Uh, if they're in mountain terrain, it would be minus three. Okay, so let's say they're in clear terrain and the result ends up being a four. 
It's going to be the same result for both of them. It's one die roll, but we go across and we're going to look at two different columns. So, um, and okay, the slash, the number in front of the slash is the attacker and the number on the right is the defender, but they're going to usually be in different columns. So remember the US, uh, they had nine points and there was no enemy artillery added. So a four, they're the attacker. In this particular attack, they would take one of damage. This number on the right side, you're not going to use it because that's not the VC column. If you remember the VC, they got bumped up to 23. Okay, so they're going to take their damage as two. So the resolution, even when you look across this chart, most of them are the same number on both sides. In some cases, it's worse for the attacker. In this case, it's going to be one point of damage to the US, two points of damage to the VC. Okay, and we're going to assess that and it's going to keep going on and on. Okay, and by the way, a instance of combat can have an infinite number of rounds. So we have turns, okay, but then within a turn, each unit can conduct one operation, but if they get in a battle, that battle can go any number of rounds. It could go one round, it, it could go on, some of them will go on for a long, long time with a lot of rounds. It's attrition, it's very much attrition uh, battle. Okay, so this definitely takes some getting used to the mechanics, but you'll get used to drawing this particular uh, thing and doing this crossways calculation a lot. You're gonna be doing this quite often. Now, this is a point that's controversial here. Uh, very clearly, this game is giving way more power to firepower than to ground power. And in some cases, you'll see you'll be even better off if you don't have any ground power, but my gosh, firepower is big. Now, I understand why they're doing this because of course the Vietnam War was one that was fought with lots of firepower. We dropped more bombs on Vietnam than we dropped on all of Germany in World War II. Uh, so tremendous amount of air power and artillery power was dumped on the VC and the NVA. And that's in certainly a lot of people were killed. Got it, that's all true. How effective that was versus how effective actual ground combat was is still controversial to this day. Um, you know, I have Air Force friends who tell me, if, you know, if they just let us bomb what we wanted to bomb, we would have won the, the war right away. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I tend not to agree with this. In my opinion, I think this game and particularly this mechanics of the game right here is giving way too much strength to firepower. Uh, I mean, it, it really ends up being almost all that matters and it makes it very tough, particularly for the VC to do in this game what they could do in, in reality. Um, in, of course, they have to fight a certain kind of warfare, guerrilla warfare, sapper warfare, but these guys were phenomenal at that. I mean, that's why we call them Sir Charles. And they're really, really underrepresented in the strength in terms of this. So this artillery has tremendous power. I mean, the fact is that the, the VC were um, phenomenal in the amount of bombing damage they could take when they would go to ground, when they would go into their holes in their caves, when they knew a bombardment was coming. Uh, and if it was not accompanied by infantry, I mean, they could take an incredible amount of uh, bombardment and the U.S. commanders would think everything was dead in the free fire zone and all of a sudden entire units would pop up. So I, I, mean, I am convinced that pure firepower without the infantry to actually go in head to head does not have the power that it has in, in this game. So this is where gamesmanship really, really comes in. If you want to win the game, you want to win the battle, you're just going to pow, is, is pump as much artillery and, and air power on any encounter as you can, whereas I don't think that is actually accurate. Anyway,
that's the way it's going to play out. So let's look at something for uh, a, an example here. Before we do look at an example, I want to return to our combat resolution chart here. Uh, now, this to me is when we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of this game, this is one of the ugly. Uh, there's two things in this game that uh, kind of bug me, and the CRT is definitely one of them. Now, as I said, a lot of the mechanisms of this game you really appreciate them the more you play it. And so I know there are a lot more experienced players than me out there who've played this a lot. And maybe someone really gets this table and understands the genius of it. I will have to confess that I still don't understand the genius of these numbers in the way they're laid out. And particularly at the lower end, when you get to the bigger battles, yeah, this this all pretty much makes sense. It's It's not bad. Smaller battles are end up being really weird, though. And particularly, look at this column here, the first column. This is the 1 to the 3.5, okay, if you're attacking a single battalion. And you look at the numbers that are here. Uh, to me, there is no logic to um, these particular numbers in the way they are distributed. Okay, so for example, um, Let's say I am attacking a one point battalion, which is pretty weak. Okay, let's look at this example here. We have a one strength, ineffective Arvin battalion sitting in a city. Okay, it's defending a town. And let's say it gets attacked by this three strength VC battalion. Now, three strength is a pretty strong VC battalion. Okay. Um, now, historically, just knowing reality, you're talking about an ineffective unit sitting guarding a village in a large VC battalion, you know, 500 VC come in. Okay. That Arvin unit is going to head for the hills, man. I, it's very unlikely that they are going to stand and fight in that situation. But in in the way the rules of the game are, this unit is basically going to turn into the Spartan 300. The reason is, when we go back and look at the CRT, okay, which is up here. That unit has a strength of one. Now, every v, uh, every Vietnamese town has a provincial guard. They're like the equivalent of two points. So total ground strength of three. Now that's regardless of what the VC brings in because the VC don't have artillery. So they, the same way we did that calculation, that unit is gonna take damage on this column. Uh, unless the VC can bring in some artillery. Now, if you're looking at it, the numbers to the right of the slash indicate damage. Now, it's only a one strength unit and you don't count in the provincial forces when you're actually assessing damage. They're only there for the combat ratio. Okay, so essentially the VC is looking to score a one and whether they have to take casualties themselves to do that, they're probably willing to do that. But if I look at this column and I want to score at least a hit of one against them, well, I can roll a minus two and get it. I can roll a four and get it. Roll a six and get it without any casualties or if I roll a high number, okay, if I can get my bonuses up here, uh, that'll be good. But as you see, it's going to be a one-to-one, -one, so I'm not getting any bonuses here because we take the one point of VC, uh, of Arvin strength, add the provincials, it ends up being three to three. And so it's really hard for that, B, uh, that VC battalion to roll the number they need to get to make a hit. Okay, so I would be just as happy if I could roll a four as a six so I can put in the damage and kill that Arvin unit and move in and take that town, which we know is worth a lot in the overall mechanics of the game. Now, 
you may look at this and say, well, who says the higher numbers have to be better? They, they can be randomly distributed. Okay, I would grant you that in principle, but the fact here is in this game, pluses are a good thing and minuses are a bad thing. It's set up so that the more you do, the more pluses you attain based on the terrain, based on uh, what you put into the, how much you commit to the battle. So pluses are supposed to be a good thing, but they end up not being. And so you end up with many, many situations here where let's say you have the VC in that situation, they go in and roll a four. Well, I'd be very happy with the result of four, right? Because it would be enough to kill that Arvin battalion. But let's say we had a plus one. Okay, now we're on a five and we're getting zero. Okay, so essentially you're being penalized for having the bonuses. It's really hard to kill something in this column if you don't have artillery. Now, let's go back and look at that example again. And this is, in, in my mind, is where it gets really hairy. Okay, so we have, again, there's this one strength ineffective Arvin unit. Here comes a VC battalion. Okay, so now it's a three to one ratio. Okay, boom, in comes another one. Now this one's a little different because it's actually got mortars. Okay, but I could bring this guy in. I could bring this guy in. Now the combat ratio is gonna go up. Yes, that is true. Right, so the combat ratio, the bonus is going to go up, yes. But that Arvin unit is still gonna take its damage on this chart, why? Because we brought in all this extra VC strength, which I mean is really unrealistic for what they're going after in that, in that battle. They still have a combat strength of one because we haven't brought in any artillery. Now we bring in, uh, say an NVA artillery battalion and we can knock them up into one of these higher columns, then you have a good chance of killing them. It's still gonna be relatively difficult to kill that unit the way it is. Now, the VC are gonna take damage based on their ground strength. So now they're gonna be taking damage in here. And I, I just don't think that is realistic, okay? Um, a, an, an ineffective Arvin battalion. I, I mean, even the sight of this much enemy strength coming from that far away, okay, they're gonna be gone. They're gonna be halfway to Saigon. Now, I think a big part of my issue with the CRT may be these little symbols here. And perhaps I'm reading this incorrectly and missing something. Um, I mean, this game is so well designed and so carefully and meticulously put together. I, I can't think anything was um, just overlooked by accident, so I'm sure there is a logic for this. But basically, what these three symbols mean is if you roll uh, this die roll, of which they're, they're next to, you lose this type of point. So we know the U.S. has air points that it can dedicate to an operation. Uh, so if they roll the nine, then a, a point, an air point is lost, and that's a permanent air point, okay? Uh, same thing with air mobile. We haven't really talked about them, but these are the points that you spend in the same way to be able to move your units air mobily, which means they can go much further uh, and cross all sorts of terrain. Um, this one with the asterisk refers to uh, an air mobile point being lost in a hot landing zone, which any enthusiast of Vietnam history knows the hot landing zone. This is when you're landing uh, right on the enemy. Okay, so these uh, losses are in addition to what we see here. And so I think that is a factor of why we have what looks like such strange results, uh, particularly in this left-hand column. So with a six, I get to inflict one point of damage on the defender. Oh, that's good. 
But if I had a plus one and got bumped up to a seven, I, in, you know, I inflict nothing. Or an eight, I inflict nothing. Well, I think the intent, and I may be incorrect about this, is, well, that is compensated by this loss. Okay, so uh, maybe they didn't lose a strength point, but they took a loss here on the air points. And I mean, that's a perfectly legitimate way of doing it. But I think this is assuming that, you know, these air points are worth a lot more, right? Or an air mobile point, like this is a really big loss. And therefore, you would much rather not have this. My feeling is um, that, I, you know, I would rather have the option of choosing the strength points because for one thing these losses only apply if they're involved in the particular operation so like only the US has air points so the VC is not going to lose an air point they're not going to lose an air mobile point it has to be involved in the operation so if we're doing an operation and nobody was air mobile anywhere if it was just road movement then there's no air mobile points uh, to lose and so forth and also you can only lose one so say we roll this roll of nine um, someone loses an air point we roll it again they don't lose another air point they can only lose a max of one air point now when we look at it when we look at what they cost okay Three air points cost the U.S. the same as three replacement points. And I would argue that uh, replacement points are an even bigger loss because if you m manage to lose enough of them in a turn, it could lead to a loss of a unit, which is a huge morale loss. Uh, loss of air points, they, they don't affect uh, your morale. And so in my thinking... Um, I'm going to attack a ground unit. Uh, the fact that I get to lose an air point rather than losing a ground strength point, taking a hit there, uh, to me that's getting off cheap. And so I, if, if these are intended as the compensation for why things go down when you go from six to seven, uh, I, I don't think it's such a big deal because it's you know very possible that this is not going to be involved. So let's say... I'm attacking a, uh, let's say, a VC unit of one strength, and I roll a six. Okay, that's one point of damage on the defender. That's enough to kill him. But let's say I had a bonus for some reason, okay, because I have, let's say, um, I have a strength advantage. Okay, so I get a, uh, a plus one. Now they take no damage. And you say, oh, okay, yeah, but they're going to take an air mobile loss, but yet they don't have any air mobile points. So that's the way I understand it. Um, now, if I'm misreading this, I've looked in the rules, but if I'm misreading this, please let me know. So, I mean, the way I would play this is if you don't have these points to lose, then you lose the strength point. So in that example, if I'm attacking a VC battalion and I roll a 7 and I know they don't have any air mobile points, then they will take one point of um, regular damage, strength point damage, replacement point damage. I mean, I think that's the kind of house rule that makes this a little better. Another issue that may be uh, pointed out about this CRT is it's definitely focused on attrition. And that's, that's definitely the big thing here. And I get that, but I would draw a distinction between um, a war of attrition and a strategy of attrition, which is basically uh, definitely what this is. This is a war of attrition um, versus individual small unit encounters aren't necessarily going to be battles of attrition. And for the most part, they're not going to be. So yes, uh, we're waging a war of attrition against the enemy. Um, now, ironically, General Westmoreland thought he was the one waging the war of attrition. He was actually the one being attrited. Uh, but yes, this captures attrition very well. And this is definitely a war of attrition. But 
in any individual encounter, if a U.S. brigade is trapping a VC battalion in their base, uh, they're not going for attrition. They're not going to st- stand there and exchange losses. I mean, th- this going to be uh, a tactical maneuver. They're going in to destroy that battalion in looking to neutralize, render ineffective another unit and take it off the map. Now, without a doubt, firepower, particularly against conventional units out in the open, uh, something like NVA armor uh, coming down a road, of course, it's going to be devastating, like we saw in the Easter Offensive, for example. It's going to have tremendous power. Uh, if we're, we're talking about guerrilla operations in the jungle, VC type operation, certainly lots and lots of firepower was used. Uh, the question of whether that was a decisive factor is still people debating it to this day. Um, this game comes down very heavily on the side of the uh, firepower. So let's look at uh, an extreme example. Okay, so right here we have a U.S. 175 millimeter uh, howitzer battalion sitting on a hill by all by itself. Now, you may say to me, that's completely unrealistic. It would not be in that position. I would say in real life, yes. In the game, mm, not so much. Okay, so, and let's say it's sitting there all by itself. And again, a VC battalion with strength of three uh, manages to come in and attack its position. Okay, now reality uh, no artilleryman is going to want to be on that firebase in that situation. But in the game, really, the VC are going to get waxed. And the reason is, okay, if we look at this, uh, now this unit has a strength of zero. It's ground strength. But zero strength units, if they're attacked, they have a defense of one. Meaning, I mean, obviously, if they're being overrun, they're going to try and defend themselves with, with what small arms they have, and they do. Okay, so this has a ground strength of one. Uh, the VC, of course, have a strength of three. So they're going to get three to one advantage when they attack. Now, this terrain is a minus three, so it's going to be an even attack here. We saw on the CRT how difficult it is to kill a one strength unit. I mean, the VC are just gonna have to get a lucky roll if they wanna score uh, a hit, and it's, it's gonna be pure luck. However, the US unit has a strength of, a firepower of 10, okay? And we saw when it comes to calculating the damages, the firepower is more important. Now, someone may point out that there's a limit to how much firepower you can count in a combat ratio. This is absolutely true. The unit cannot count more than three times its ground strength. So this unit has a ground strength effectively of one. They cannot count more than three points of this artillery for the combat ratio. But as we've seen, the combat ratio is not the key thing. The key thing is what column you end up for damages. They can count all 10 uh, firepower points for damages. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, this VC unit, yeah, it's got a three to one advantage. I mean, it's not going to have when we con- when we uh, count this in. It's going to be equal strength. But... When we assign damages, the VC unit is going to take damages on a chart on on the column for 13. Three points of its own and the 10 points of artillery. The U.S. has got nominal one here and zero. They're going to be on that one chart. Again, it's going to take a lucky roll to score a hit on them. Whereas if we go to the CRT for 13... um, Excuse me, all right, that's here. Okay, we see uh, the VC are the attackers. Uh, they're very likely gonna be taking damage. Okay, and that, that damage is gonna rack up. Now, the reality though is, okay, back to this. This artillery unit has the advantage in this encounter. Now, it, there's, there's just no way in reality that that's accurate. This artillery in support of an infantry attack 
on the VC unit, yes, it's going to do a, a significant amount of damage. But in this situation, uh, realistically, no, it, it's not. Um, for one thing, these are 175 millimeter howitzers. These are long distance weapons. Yeah, they could use them in direct fire, but the terrain, is, the, the avenue of approach is going to have to be absolutely perfect. Uh, it's very unlikely that that's going to happen. And more likely than not, if this unit makes it up here and is able to infiltrate this position, they're not even going to use those howitzers in defense You know, when the VC are that close. First of all, they have very little chance of hitting them. And that means if they do try and use them, the VC are going to know exactly where the U.S soldiers are positioned you know they're right behind the guns and that's where you're going to go for and they're going to get nailed okay they're going to be using their small arms they're going to be going to their defensive positions in their bunkers and so forth so the 10 artillery really shouldn't even be playing into an attack like this okay i mean you know this attack is going to be coming at night uh, you know if they get that close if you get charlie in the wire it's just not going to play out that way. Now, of course, you would say in real life, you, you would never put an artillery unit out there by itself, particularly 175 millimeter howitzers, which are extremely expensive weapons. You're not going to put them out there by themselves. They're going to have infantry support. In real life, yes, absolutely. No artillery commander is going to let his unit sit out there. In the game, eh. Um, you could put it out there and probably the VC aren't even going to attack it. Uh, if I were them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't attack this because I know um, gamesmanship, it's, it's not going to go well for me. And so this is one of the trade-offs when you're playing is do you play this realistically or do you play, you know, according to the game, uh, the game scenario. And, you know, I try to do it realistically, even if gamesmanship would be, um you know play one way like for example would you stick this artillery unit in a town on the border all by itself of course not in reality no i mean they're gonna get, they're gonna get killed game wise yeah they, they could defend this this area pretty well so i'm not gonna do this because i know this is something that's completely unrealistic but if i'm playing a game trying to beat somebody um, you might do it. So this is one of the areas in my mind in terms of house rules you really have to apply. Uh, it, it has to be some sort of cap on um, the firepower and what it can do. And I would cap that based on where the attack is coming. If the unit's coming down a road, if they're in open terrain, for sure. If it's this VC unit moving in the jungle out here, uh, the amount of this firepower should be capped because it, that is just not realistic. I mean, yeah, we, we did dump a ton of firepower on jungle hexes. You know, the effectiveness is, is, is highly debatable. Okay. So that's the combat mechanic. Now, someone out there might scream foul at my description, uh, saying it's misleading and it is because uh, there's one more factor to get to that is going to influence uh, this particular type of battle. Okay, so let's look at an example of combat and to show why the pursuit values are so important. So here we are down in the Delta again. It's full of VC everywhere. And let's look at this battalion here. This is a strong VC battalion, ground strength of three, artillery strength of one. It's actually got, and we're going to attack this with basically a brigade out of the 101st. And this brigade has got the artillery broken out into the battalion so they're going to take it with them okay so let's say they come and land right on top of this vc unit now this is not a particularly advantageous situation so the vc would more than likely want to alert out of there we talked about the alert movement let's say they're unable to do it let's say they roll a one and they're unable to get away and so they have to fight 
Okay, so combat is going to occur the way we described. Okay, this ends up being a three to one ratio in favor of the US. They're not gonna do a free fire zone here. It's not very favorable to the VC. So we're gonna roll for damages and it turns out that the US takes one point of damage and the VC unit takes two points of damage. Now, due to something that I haven't discussed yet, but we're gonna mention soon, uh, they're both gonna take this out of their replacement points. So they can suck up the damage, but uh, definitely the VC wants the bleeding to stop here, and the US wants to hunt down this unit and kill it for good. Okay, now, as we've said, the VC are slippery, and they manage to get away, and so normally that would be an issue. Uh, according to the rules, after combat, a unit can retreat its full movement point value. Okay, so if we look at this VC unit, it's got a movement point of six. And so it's going to want to get out of there and probably go towards these units where it's got help. Okay, so we're going to move out of there. Now, it's going to cost us three to get out of the enemy occupied hex. It's going to cost another two to get out of the enemy zone of control. That leaves one movement point. Uh, we can go here next to our friend, and we're away from the U.S. unit. So we might say that that VC unit is safe, okay, because they've managed to escape. Aha, but the combat is not going to end there, and this is where the pursuit is going to come in. So when we look at our CRT, The column on the end here is the pursuit modifier. This again is a unique aspect of the combat system, at least as far as I know, and it's a very important one. Okay, so we said based on the, the combat that took place, um, the US, well, the four was the ended up being the role, and so that comes to a pursuit bonus of plus one and notice these are all the same it doesn't matter what column you are on you get a very bad one you can get a very good one okay now in general uh, combat in this game can go on and on for a lot of rounds this is a very much an attrition based game uh, you see there's not a lot of really decisive results here on the chart you're bleeding the other side down but essentially what you want to try and do is move up the pursuit chart this is basically um, the goal so let's say the US scored a four so they got a plus one as long as they're on the plus side that's good they're gonna to want to go as far down this chart as they can and get up as high as they can why is that okay because this is where they can really affect what's going on in the battle Okay, so notice they had a pursuit modifier of plus one. Now, when we look at the units themselves, they have a plus two here. So this is their pursuit bonus that that unit has under all circumstances. Some units have a zero. This unit has a plus one. Some units have none. Having none and having zero are not the same thing. Um, okay, so these units all have a plus two and this is important that it goes by the the basically the slowest unit in the stack so if they had a a, a zero unit in there they would either leave it behind or um, it's going to slow them down in this case they all have a plus two they just scored a plus one so this means they have a pursuit bonus of plus three now it costs the VC unit a lot to move here because they were moving out of enemy occupied hexes. It's actually not gonna cost the US much of anything. With the three movement points, boom, they can land right on top of them and attack them again. Okay, and so this is how we're gonna be able to chase them down is using these pursuit bonuses. Aha, that's one thing, but something even better. Suppose we don't do that. Suppose I only use two of these points 
and I have one left over, right? We had three, three pursuit points. We only used two. We've got one left over. Well, the great thing is excess pursuit points end up being added to your die roll for the next attack. Okay. Uh, the VC can't alert. You can only alert move on the first turn. So that's not an option to them. So we're going to get to hit them at a plus one. Okay. Let's say we roll. Okay. We roll a five. We add the plus one. That puts us on the six row. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Now it's a plus two. Okay. Let's. So we're going to add the plus two the next time we hit them. Okay, and the idea is these bonuses will drive up your die rolls, which are going to drive up your bonuses. So as long as you're moving up this chart, you're building up bonuses and you're getting stronger. And this is typically what is going to happen. Um, the U.S. is going to be able to corner the VC. I mean, they're either going to go across the border and you lose them, or you're going to corner them in a place where they can't get away and start racking up uh, these pursuit bonuses till eventually you hit you know hit the 11 hit the big column on the chart and, and then you'll kill them and at some point they'll realize that you're going to kill them so we're either going to catch this unit and kill it you now in this case it can probably get away but if we were going for this one let's say if the combat were down here uh, you know, we're probably going to be able to nail this thing and continually bring up those bonuses until we kill it, until they realize, hey, it's, they're going to have to take the damage. Uh, the other thing is that they can't absorb any more losses than their max. So if we got a score of two here, it would kill this unit. Okay, so the pursuit Bonus, uh, bonuses become very important. And so this is why U.S. units like here, the 101st, and it's an air mobile unit, that bonus of plus two is really good. Okay, Some units have a bonus of plus three. They're going to be very effective at chasing down the units and getting um, attack bonuses. Now the VC, you see most of them have a zero that means they're only going to get what bonus they they got so if they rolled a, a plus two bonus then they get a plus two it's other units that have none that's not the same as zero if you have none that means you can't pursue and there's the, the one exception is these u.s units uh, we can spend air mobile points to air mobilize them and use that in pursuit but that's expensive uh, and that's something uh, fairly rare. Notice the VC, um, excuse me, the Arvin battalions, they have a minus one. So they're going to have one off of whatever they score. So, I mean, th these units really aren't made to pursue. So this is one way you can affect um, the combat. So even if you're trying to kill one of those pesky low point units it's hard to do it on the first roll but if you start building up these pursuit bonuses um you're going to be able to get them which is essentially what the the vc would have to do if they were attacking one of these arvin units down here um, is start building up those bonuses to the point where they could kill it and the arvin unit is either going to abandon that city or it's going to die okay all right, so that's uh, some of the basics of the combat system. As I say, it seems unique to me, and it uh, definitely captures the idiosyncrasies of combat in this game. Now, one of the, uh, the frequent house rules that's mentioned is limiting the number of phases that combat can go through, because right now they can combat can go on for you know x number of rounds okay okay so i think the main issue i have with the the combat system and the emphasis on firepower is it's asking us to imagine one kind of combat going on now the, the game is, is is good in that it simplifies that we don't have a, a lot of different um types of combat going on but the reality is uh, if we have one U.S. battalion fighting one V.C. battalion out in the jungle, that could represent all kinds of different conflict, 
going on. I mean, the, the actual battle could be any number of different scenarios. In some of those, firepower may be extremely important. In others, it may not. Okay, so let's look at a, a scenario here. Here again, we have a VC battalion out in the jungle. Uh, U.S. unit lands on top of them, and they have a big artillery unit within support range. Now, the issue I have is this could actually be representing a lot of different situations. And in some of them, the firepower might be more important than others. So let's say that VC unit has been sitting there and this is a base that they have in the jungle. And now we attack them. Well, the first thing they do when they set up is they build defenses against bombardment because they know they get bombed constantly. So they're going to build the bunkers. They're going to build the holes to go into and so forth. And this is really rugged terrain. So this 10 points of artillery plus this artillery here raining down on them. Yeah, it's probably going to shake their world, but they are generally pretty well set up to endure that bombardment and survive. Now, when the three points of infantry go in after that, they're really going to be able to do a lot of damage because that bombardment, uh, it may not kill them, but it's going to shake them up and leave them shell-shocked for a while, which is the idea. This is combined arms, firepower and uh, maneuver working together. So, once these um, U.S. soldiers go into their tunnels, go into their caves, they're really going to be able to do a lot of damage because they've been softened up by the artillery. But that's a case where these three these three infantry points are way more influential in that battle than the artillery points. However, on this um, combat chart, that's not going to be the case. It's going to be the 13 artillery which are doing um, the killing. Now, Something different, we could be having a VC unit moving down a road. Uh, these guys pin them down, and then this artillery falls on them. Uh, that's probably going to do a lot of damage because you've got them out in the open where they don't have a lot of defense. Okay, so there are different types of situations. Uh, now, this unit here, uh, they could be sitting in a base. You know, something like Quezon, where, you know, we have defoliated this entire area. So it looks like, you know, the landscape of the moon. And so when this unit is attacking, uh, you know, when they're this far out, they're getting bombed like crazy. They probably never make it to this location. So all I'm saying is um, that I think there are a lot of different scenarios how combat actually plays out. In some of them, firepower is going to count for a lot more than others. And this is kind of asking us to look at one scenario, which is basically pretty much troops out in the open where you can bring the firepower to them. And so I would much rather see the CRT be based on combat ratios, meaning however many points you have. Um, since we don't know exactly what's happening in this hex, count everything together. And I wouldn't assign damage based on how much infantry you have on your side and then how much artillery the other guy has. Another issue with this is it tends to make a liability for you to bring in more infantry. So if these units are fighting and this unit is in U.S. units engaged, they're going to want to bring in all the firepower they can. And that's really going to boost up the killing that they can do. It's sort of a mixed bag whether you bring in more infantry to support you because the more infantry you have, the more casualties you take. I don't think that is necessarily the case. When you have an overwhelming amount of infantry, I think you bring your casualties down because you're able to maneuver from different sides. Your units are able to, to feint, to combine their maneuver and so forth. So I think if we have uh, an overwhelming amount they say we've got nine points of U.S. infantry hitting one point of V.C. The fact that you have so much uh, overwhelming infantry power, I think, reduces your casualties um, because you're able to hit them from all sides at once. You're able to really take away a lot of the defense they have, where in this case, that's not the case. Those, those extra infantry points are probably going to cause you casualties and not them. For example, if... 
this U.S. battalion is located right on the same hex with the VC and calling in artillery from a distance, that's going to be danger close artillery fire. And particularly if you use something big like 175s, there's going to be a lot of friendly casualties um, to that. And so in that case, that should be bumping up the friendly casualties as well as the enemy. I mean, that's a last dish maneuver that you would do, uh, but it doesn't. It's the enemy infantry plus the friendly artillery and vice versa. Whereas in, in reality, if you're fighting that close in that kind of environment, um, you know, the, the enemy may be, you know, 50 yards away from you and you've got these huge artillery uh, rounds impacting all around you. you you're going to be hitting everybody that way. Okay. Say for as many scenarios as you could come out with that really, you know, back up the idea of having the artillery firepower being the decisive thing, you can come up with just as many of it being a situation where it's not. Okay, so now we said we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of this game. And this is what I would consider the ugly is talking about replacement points. And this is... I used to be very anti-replacement points, uh, but come to see it more and more as just another of the idiosyncrasies that captures... Uh, the unique nature of the Vietnam conflict. And so it's definitely one of those things that you have to learn to deal with. So I don't know as I am as negative about it as I used to be, but you'll see there are some uh, definite gamesmanship aspects to this. So I think the replacement points is an area where you want to look at imposing some house rules, putting some caps on this, because it can get out of hand. I think it can get a little unrealistic, but uh, like many things in this game, the more you play it, at least I'm able to realize uh, what the intent was behind the design and how it is actually very clever. Our general uh, record track, as you see, and you can probably guess, these are the replacement point markers. There is one for every faction out there. Okay, and we buy replacement points the same way, eh, let me tell you, basically we buy them the same way we buy anything else. So if you look at this chart, this is what it costs for the U.S. to buy certain things. We can buy a unit, we can, you know, buy um, some support for the South Vietnam, okay, and we can also buy replacement points and, and they're fairly close to what a unit would count so um, three replacement points count cost one commitment a battalion costs one commitment but your typical battalion is a three strength points okay so it's it's fairly simple so again you can buy as many replacement points as you want you could shoot the moon and buy a hundred replacement points and you know move this all the way down here you could go cheap on the replacement points. What are these things? Uh, basically, this is like a sponge for damage. Now, they make the point in the rules that replacement points do not strictly represent human replacements for dead soldiers. I mean, even though we know like the U.S. was replacing individual soldiers on a daily basis. It's not just that. It represents supplies. It represents resources, money, uh, morale, the political will, and so forth. So if a unit takes a hit, like in those examples we saw, okay, the, the VC, they took some damage. Basically, that means they're sucking up that damage as part of their, over of their overall personnel strength, their overall ammunition, supplies, everything else. So they can suck up the damage. So we essentially have the option. Let's look down here. Here again, here's our three-point uh, VC unit. Uh, let's say that on combat, it takes a hit of one. 
their option would be to either use up one replacement point or um, to use up that many strength points. Now, say the U.S. unit, this unit took a hit of one and there were no more replacement points, we would have to sacrifice an entire unit and we'd send it to the Deadpool. Uh, and so that becomes uh, significant. All right, so so let's take an example to show the, the real effect that um, these replacement points have. Now this is, granted, this is an extreme, very unlikely example, but this is just to really show the mechanism. Okay, so we have here a U.S. brigade, essentially three battalions, that are being surrounded by uh, a lot of NVA and VC. So let's suppose in combat, um, we roll combat and the communist player scores one hit of victory, okay? And then they roll again, same result. And they roll again, another result, one. Okay, I mean, now that's unusual that you would get that, but I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. Okay, so the U.S. has just taken three hits of damage over three turns. They could go and just move their replacement marker down three points, and let's say combat ends there and um, the NLF goes away, and we've just lost three replacement points. Well, three replacement points cost one commitment, so basically they've made us use up one commitment point. There's no morale value. Now, let's say, however, same situation, but the U.S. replacements are down to zero because they've been attacking us all over. Uh, they've had an offensive, perhaps, ground us down, and so we now we have no replacements left. Well, we're going to want to avoid combat uh, wherever we can. Why? Because same exact situation. Okay, let's say this time the NVA rolls again, 1-1 one, one damage. They have replacement points left, so they're just going to move their, their marker down one. We have no more replacements left. We have to suck up that one point of damage, but we can't eliminate a partial unit. So we have no choice but to send this unit to the dead pool. Now, we're going to be trying like crazy to get out of there, but they're still going to be able, they've got us surrounded. They're going to be able to hit us a couple more turns. Again, same thing. One, one of damage. Okay. They're going to move their marker down one. We have no choice. Boom. A uh, third unit goes. And let's say they were, they get to hit us one more time. Again, one, one. Boom. We have no choice but to eliminate this unit. And that's it. So the difference is, Three points of damage have been inflicted, but because of that sponge, because of the replacement points, in one case, we ended up using up three replacement points, which was the equivalent of one point of commitment. No morale. Okay, not bad. In the other case, we ended up losing three battalions. Now, as we know, the morale effect of using uh, losing a U.S. battalion is a minus three. Okay, and so what's going to happen, that would be minus nine morale right there. So it's the same combat. It's nine times more effective because we've run out of replacement points. Now, again, this is a very unusual example. This is unlikely to happen. It's the extreme, but it, it plays out in smaller amounts throughout the game. So this is the the advantage of having that sponge of replacement points that you're going to have. So a single battle can absorb all of the replacement points in theater, basically, uh, which just seems to me unrealistic. Now, uh, of course, there's the Quezon example we point to that where tremendous amounts of resources were spent there, but that's because in Quezon, uh, the airstrip stayed open the entire time and we were able to pour in uh, those types of resources. And so that's somewhat of an unusual situation. That's not necessarily going to be the case of, let's say, for a, a Viet Cong battalion that gets cornered down in the Delta. They're not going to be able to suck up the entire resources of the, the NLF uh, just because they want to. And one of the 
biggest complaints, the biggest complaint about this game you see on all the comments is it's a really great, awesome game, but it's so tedious to play um, that it's just not worth doing it. And I think a big reason for that is the replacement point system. Because the way this typically is going to play out is you're going to have to keep fighting, and it may be just one battle that keeps going on and on through unlimited phases until one side's replacement points go down to zero, and then they realize, okay, from now on, any hits we take, we're going to lose units, and they start avoiding combat. Uh, I would highly recommend putting a cap on how many replacement points you can buy per turn and how many can be expended in a particular battle. Now, there is a rule that says a unit can't suck up more than its strength. So if we have a one strength battalion and they take two hits, you cannot use two replacement points to keep them alive. But you, you get something like a, a, a six point VC regiment. I mean, that, that's going to be able to take hits all day long. And I think there has to be a, a limit. I mean, they just cannot get the replacements to that location um, consistently. So this is one area I think uh, where I definitely use some house rules to limit the effects of, you know, give, give a certain amount. You can have 10 replacement points a turn, but yeah, once we start taking hits, it's going to be making units ineffective and taking them off the battlefield. And anyway, that's just my take on it. All right. Now, having said all of that, what is the final opinion on this game? Well, as we said, this is a classic, and you'll want to play it just to see the interesting system and the great mechanics to it. But what would it take to make this a truly great game? Well, the first thing is sometimes it feels like you're playing two games at once here. The strategic versus the tactical part of the game. And it can be a bit frustrating. Now, I think the frustrations here, as in many parts of the game, just reflect the reality of the conflict. This was, of course, a very frustrating conflict for everybody, for the president, for the generals, and so forth. And the designer has done a good job at capturing those frustrations, but doesn't necessarily mean you want to live through them again. So part of the frustration here is that the tactical game can seem divorced from the strategic game in the sense of, as the U.S. player, particularly once you get all that artillery on board, I mean, you can really just run the entire map, um, really wipe out the enemy units everywhere unless they manage to escape and get away from you. And as the uh, communist player, it can be very frustrating because it seems like no matter what firepower you bring on, uh, how many troops you bring on, um, you end up just getting crushed by the, uh, the firepower of um, the U.S. forces. But at the same time, that turns out to be not what decides the game. What decides the game is essentially morale and commitment. So all those victories are leading the U.S. player to break their morale, get out, and then somebody else wins the game. So it's, um, I don't know, kind of feels like you're in a, a soccer game and you're scoring a lot of goals, but then you find out scoring the goals was not the... Um, not the objective here. The objective was the side that sweats less and you end up losing. So it's something like that. Now that reflects the reality that this was a political conflict. This was not um, a strictly military conflict, but it's like these two things can seem highly disjointed. And I think part of the issue is because this is a war game, this is from victory games. And so you really don't get to play the political aspect. I mean, there is a political side to the game. It's one of the more interesting aspects of the game, but it's almost like it's out of your hands. I mean, you can't win as the U.S. player unless you get the South Vietnamese morale up. But you can't do that if you keep getting handed these lousy leaders. So like I say, I always get Chu and he's going to bring the morale down no matter what. Now, you can try and get rid of him by having a coup, but to induce a coup, the U.S. only gets to add 
two to the die roll, which means you have to be pretty borderline anyway in order to be able to successfully induce a coup. And so the net result of that is if the loyalty is low enough that you can get rid of Mr. Chu, there's a real good chance there's going to be an unwanted coup that pops up later, probably several of them, and you're going to get some dud back, either him or somebody else who's going to bring the morale down. Now, this absolutely reflects the reality. This reflects what uh, McNamara and Johnson had to deal with and, you know, uh, why Johnson talked about the South Vietnamese leadership in such colorful and um, obscene terms. But I think the frustrating thing as a player is there's really very little you can do to influence that. So if it is true that this is not strictly a military struggle and that there's a lot of political aspects to it, you don't have the uh, options in this game. You don't have the tools in order to affect that. There's tiny little things you can do. You can, you know, give a die roll for a, an economic aid plan, but you can't go in and fix the political system. I mean, you can't be whatever, building schools and hospitals and, uh, you know, pressuring the government to fix their act. And so that ends up being a bit frustrating. Does it get the idea of what it's like trying to run a military campaign in this corrupt and politically broken environment? Yes. But, you know, just because they were frustrated doesn't mean you want to be frustrated also. So that's one aspect of it that I think um, is, is something if, if there's a modification later on, it would be to give uh, some aspect where you can spend some of your commitment points to actually do something about the political system in the villages and the provinces, give you a chance. Um, you know, I mean, that's when General Ab Abrams took over. That's a lot of what he did was the pacification effort, trying to get down and influence the mood in the villages and hamlets. Okay, so that's one point. Secondly, as far as the tactical game goes, uh, I will again stress my opinion and probably uh, draw a lot of comments, uh, people who disagree with me. But I'm still going to say that the system, the way the CRT is based so heavily on firepower, I've made my argument here why I don't think that's necessarily the best thing. Uh, I would like to see that revised. A revised CRT, which really places more emphasis on uh, the combat ratios because Again, yeah, there are some situations in jungle guerrilla combat where artillery is going to be more useful than small arms, but you can counter every one of those with a scenario in which the opposite is true. So let's not privilege one kind of point on the CRT, okay? I think that would be a big revision. It would be a very good. And uh, I think the other revision which would be very helpful, like I said, is with the replacement point system, somehow limiting that. Uh, because again, I say this is more of a game mechanic thing than a reality. Um, because if, if you look at this as an abstraction, what are you trying to do? You're trying to affect the other side's morale. Okay, you're trying to drag down the U.S. morale. You're trying to drag down the South Vietnamese uh, morale. And you do that by killing their forces. Uh, by, by killing Americans is how you bring down the American morale. And when you bring it down enough, they will quit. And um, that is going to be the biggest thing in the game. And so, I mean, honestly, the replacement point system is just a way of abstracting this. I mean, you could be using individual encounters the way you do in, in, in any other game and killing off counters and you have to replace them with new counters. Or uh, you could be using this replacement chart system as, as a matter of tallying up the losses. So, for example, I killed a three strength point unit or I killed three of your replacement points. Well, it costs the same to replace them. 
The big difference is for the U.S., there's a morale cost for losing a unit that is not there for you losing the replacements. And I think that is very unrealistic, uh, particularly in terms of the U.S. That's the one where casualties really, really had the biggest impact. And so I think, if nothing else, um, the campaign game should work like the individual scenarios where inflicting replacement point damage does count. So whether you kill off the enemy's replacement points or kill off their units, you still get victory points. That should be in the main game, at least for the U.S. player. Um, the U.S. should suffer morale loss for losing replacement points. Now, again, I know replacements are not strictly human replacements, but that's part of it. That's obviously a part of it. Um, and again, the American public, they just see how many Americans are killed. Um, you know, whether it's one battalion out of the 101st that gets destroyed or uh, 500 soldiers, you know, from across the country, it's going to have the same impact. Similarly, I think there's another problem with um, even using replacement points for, uh, say, the VC and the NVA. Uh, they, they didn't really have that capability. I mean, the NVA would send a unit down the trail. It would get down into southern Vietnam and fight until it was wiped out. And meanwhile, there were more units coming down the trail. Uh, you know, if the 7th NVA Division is getting plastered down in the Mekong Delta, they don't really have the ability to be sending replacements, whatever those replacements are, humans, equipment, whatever it is you want to call it. They didn't really have the capability to be sending replacements to that unit and keeping it alive. It pretty much got pounded and then another unit took its place. So again, my, my whole thing with the replacement point system, yeah, maybe the U.S. can have that system because of the way we did replacements, but it should be limited. I mean, there should be a cap, a pretty low cap put on uh, what kind of replacements, how much you can have. Those should count for morale points, so it shouldn't be that different. And that would just make the playing experience uh, more enjoyable. I think it's more enjoyable and more what you want to see in a war game is you're defeating little units on the map rather than you know watching this chart that starts out with 520 morale points and working it way its way down to to nothing you know a couple of points at a time uh, that can get somewhat tedious so those are big things that I would fix and if you did that I think this would be uh, an absolutely phenomenal game, but the fact that it has lasted 30 plus years, even in the era of computer games that nowadays compute all this stuff for you, is absolutely amazing, and I think that's a testament to what a great game this is. So, again, while there are modifications I think you could make to make this uh, a really great game. It's still a tremendous accomplishment as it is. And definitely if you're an enthusiast, you're going to want to pick this up. So thank you for listening to all of this. That's my opinion. And I hope to see you in the future. Bye.